All right, welcome everyone to this week's Autonomy Talks. This week is a great ple pleasure to have Maria Bausa Villalonga, I hope I spelled it correctly, uh, who is a PhD student uh, in robotics uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, working with uh, Professor Alberto Rodriguez. Something about Maria before uh, joining MIT, she received her bachelor's and, uh, and in mathematics and physics uh, from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. Her research focuses on achieving precise robotic generalization by learning probabilistic models of the world, allowing robots to reuse their skills across multiple uh, tasks and environments. And for her research, she already received several fellowships, among which uh, we note uh, Facebook Fellowship and an NVIDIA Fellowship. So uh, as you have seen in her bio, she uh, is the recipient of various uh, awards. And uh, um, among those, she participated to the MIT Princeton team uh, uh, working on the Amazon Robotics Challenge where uh, she won some prizes. Today, she's gonna talk about part of this work. Uh, the title is Learning to Interact with the World when Generality, generality Meets Precision. And we are all very happy and uh, eager to listen to the talk. So Maria, go ahead, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jelle. Thanks for this nice introduction and thanks for having me today. Um, so yeah, today I wanna talk about how we can actually allow robots to interact in a more smart way with the world and also capable to adapt to all these new situations that we want them to face. We all know that robots has a lot of potentials. They can actually ideally be part of our society and help us in many different tasks. But instead, if we think about where are robots are right now, and if you look at industry, well, we're gonna find it something that looks like this. And here you can just see some cars just helping in a car automation factory. And what I would say from this is that, yes, we have robots that if we program them, they can be really precise, but they still fall into the problem of one robot, one task. And again, usually there has been someone that usually cost as much their work as the robot itself that has been behind just programming them how to make all this work. So in fact, if you look at the 2020 survey on industrial robots, what they identify is that one of the major problems right now in automation is that if you make a small changes to your line, then what will happen is that you won't be able to reuse your robots. Sometimes you even will need to go and dispose them. And this is a problem. But now let's look at our homes. What happens there? At our homes, I would like to show you a robot that interacts more with the world. But actually, if we think about any robot, probably it looks like this, which to some extent is okay because yeah, it can work in many houses, but that comes at a cost and is that it's not very precise. And by precise, what I mean here is that it's gonna bump into things, it will just follow a random path and it will take many passes until it really does the job of just cleaning your floor. So from there, I would like to just go again and think, okay, what happens with humans? Well, it turns out that for humans, uh, we are in a different situation. Where actually right now we can just solve many tasks in many different settings. And it's just that, but actually when it's needed, we can become extremely skilled. So how do we get there? How do we have robots that when it's needed, they can also get really skilled, but at the same time, they can solve many tasks. So let me just think about, let me just make an analogy between our phone and robots. Our phone is very capable. We could say that it can solve many applications. And if you think about it, 20 years ago, we would have needed that many devices to just actually do some of the tasks that we can do right now with our phone. And it's not just that, our phone is probably even better at solving those tasks. I would like to have the same for robots. I would like to have one robot that can solve many tasks and it does them with a skill. So this would be one, of, one goal that would be a very nice to achieve, right? So how do we get there? And I think there are two axes that we need to follow. The first one is gonna be precision. How do we get robots to become more and more skilled at solving their tasks? But the second axis would be, how do we also get them to become more general, to adapt? And this will be how do we achieve what I call precise generalization, solving many tasks without compromising on precision and accuracy. One way to solve this problem will be, okay, let's first just become very precise. Let's solve some tasks very, very well. And once we know how to do that, let's figure out how to make them more general, more adaptable to new situations. 
Another option would be, let's first just think about generality, adaptability. Maybe it's just going to be for simple tasks, but at least we will be able to do something. And then let's just figure out how to make those more complex and more precise. In fact, if we look at manipulation research, what you will see is that there has been a clustering of research in both of these directions. So for instance, if you think about generality, there has been a lot of work in generality, but usually that comes at the cost that now you're just trying to solve simple tasks, like, like picking operations. And usually it's in situations where getting data is kind of easy, which is usually not the case in robotics. And then on the other axis, we have seen some words trying to just solve very complex tasks, but actually that has come at the cost of now you need very good simulations or analytical models, and usually a lot of data which is again, something that in robotics is hard to get. And I would like to argue that if we wanna to go towards precise generalization, if we go through the middle, if we think about both directions at the same time, there is exponentially many more paths that would give us, that will bring us to the top right corner of this graph. And again, we wanna follow a path that would look like this, but in practice, I think research has shown us that sometimes we just move too much into one direction and we need to, bring back some of the ideas from the other one to just keep making progress. But I think that's fine. In fact, in my own research, I have kind of suffered from this back and forth. When I started, I was looking at just how do we get robots to become very precise? And this was a task of planner pushing. And the idea was, can we learn a model that will allow a robot to push an object very precisely to follow a trajectory? And this is something that we can do and we can get the robot to be very precise as you can see here, but actually the models that we learned will only work for that object. And indeed, would even just work for that surface. So how do we get beyond that? Well, I started thinking we need generalization. So I did some works on generalization too. And I think for me, the end was, uh, not the end, but just when I uh, understood more or less how to do generalization was with the Amazon robotic challenge. And here what happened is that you were given a set of objects, your test was just pick those objects, even if the robot has never seen them. And we had to make a perception system that would work for that. But what happened is that this perception system would only work for this test. And then we think, okay, now maybe we're a bit more general, but this is not reusable. I cannot solve many tests. So you started thinking, okay, can we create a perception system that is both general and reusable, but it's also gonna be accurate? So this is what I'm gonna go next in my talk. And after that, I'm just gonna show how actually we can use these perception systems that are reusable in a task. In this case, it's gonna be pick and placing. And finally, I would like to just give some hints of what I think is important to keep moving towards this idea of precise generalization. But now let me just start with what happens when we we'll only think about generalization. And as I said before, I'm gonna explain this in the context of the Amazon Robotic Challenge. This was work that we did in 2017. And when I say Amazon Robotic Challenge, I may also say ARC for short. And the goal of this task was, we're gonna give you, we're gonna give the robot a bin full of objects. And most of the objects the robot has never seen before. And this task is just to pick them. So this was our system that we come up with. And it has this end effector that basically can do two things. The first one is suction. It can do suction on an object but then it can also do grasping on objects. These are the two capabilities of the robot. And then it also has a perception system that is based on these cameras that I just marked on the picture. So how did this work? Well, the way it worked is that you would get RGBD images and for suction, what you would do is just process them with a neural network and output an affordance map. That will basically say, if you go into this pixel, how likely is that if you use suction, you're gonna pick an object. And then for grasping, what we did is the following. We again took the point class from the RGBD images, put them in different orientations. So we could actually handle different grasp orientations and basically got again, a affordance map that will basically tell us if you go and do a grasp with this orientation, how likely is for you to pick an object? And it turns out that this worked really well. Basically here you can see how we selected that a grasp on this location is the most likely outcome to give us a pick. And despite the robot have never seen this object, is capable to just go and do a pick that succeeds. So this is our implementation. And actually this is, this is the one that, I, that won the Amazon Robotic Challenge, the stowing task. And as you can see, it really can deal with novel objects because many of these objects it has never seen before. 
But this comes at a cost. And the cost is that perception is applied to objects. We don't really know what an object means. All we know as a perception system is that if you go there and make a peak, the peak is likely or not to succeed. And the other thing that I want to mention is that handling is imprecise. Now we're grasping this bottle and it's just dropping. So it's not capable to really deal with those objects because it doesn't know about them, but it's also it's incapable to sense this interaction. It only has vision. So the thinking after the Amazon robotic challenge was what well, is missing. And we identify two components. The first one is the perception for manipulation. It makes sense that it has to be object aware. It's not enough that we just know how to make a peak. We also need to be aware of objects. And the second thing is contact information. If we want to be more precise, if we want to be more capable to handle with these objects, we need to sense interaction. We need to sense where contact is happening. So tactile sensing suddenly was something that we started to think a lot. How can we add tactile sensing into the uh, capabilities of the robots so that we can sense these interactions and become more, more precise? So now let me just go into how we now move into general and accurate perception models. And again, because we're gonna become more dexterous, we're gonna think both about vision, but also about tactile sensing. And because I'm gonna start talking about tactile sensing, I just wanna make the case about why tactile sensing is actually important. So now I'm gonna show you Jess. Jess is a blind person, but she's very capable, even though she has no uh, option to use vision. So what I wanna show you in this video that I'm gonna play in a moment is that she's very capable to grasp an object, but also localize this pose because then she's gonna show you how to use it. So let me just play this video. Now you can see how she's just identifying, locating this object. And now because it's located in her hand, she can immediately show you how to use it. And then this is another example. Again, because through tactile, through sensing the object, she's capable to identify its pose. She's also capable to very smoothly do a regress. So just pay attention because she's very, very quickly gonna do the regre this regress. And again, I think this is something that all you must do, right? We don't keep looking at our hands. We just manipulate objects with our touch. So I would like to give robots the same capabilities. And this is what I call tactile localization. How can we allow a robot to do using tactile to actually localize the pose of an object in its hands? And this is the problem that we're trying to solve. We have this robot and I'm touching it with this object. And what you can see as at the top, at the corner of the image is actually what we call a tactile image. This is the sensor information. And the important thing here is that this is a very high resolution image. It gives us a lot of information about the contact. And in fact, if you just look at this image, you can very easily say, okay, the question that you have done to answer is, where is the object pose? Where is the pose of this object with respect to the sensor? And if you just look at this image, you can very easily say that actually is this one. This is where the sensor is making contact with this object. So this is, should be our answer. But now I just want to show you a different example. Now we are just using this object instead. And what happens now is that there are two possible poses of the object that could very easily explain this contact. So now we are in a case that we are going to call non-unique contact. This is a contact that could be explained by different object poses. And this means that because of tactile, because of this locality of tactile, we can not just make contact with a whole sensor, we actually benefit from reasoning not just about the best pose, but actually distribution of our poses. So that we can take into account that for some contexts, it's not gonna be possible for us to say, this is the pose. There's gonna be ambiguity and we will need to give a pose distribution. So today I'm gonna show you our approach. It's gonna assume that we have access to the object model, to the object shape, but as a result, it's gonna give us two things. Well, beyond generality and accuracy, we're gonna be able to shift those by providing pose distributions and also not relying on any real data. So the first time that the robot goes and touches the object, it's gonna already be able to give us a precise distribution over the object pose. So now I'm gonna go about how this works. How are we solving this problem? Again, because we have the shape at, uh, of the object, what we can do is in simulation, identify contact poses. And once we have those contact poses, we can also identify uh, where contact is happening. And we do that in the form of an image. This is just a contact image that shows us where contact is happening. And then on the real side, what we have is at the sensor that is giving us tactile image. 
And then we have a calibration neural network that basically is capable to give us where contact is happening. And this is object independent because this neural network only needs to be able to say where contact is happening. And this doesn't need to know anything about the object that is making this contact. On the other side, the simulation part is object dependent, but it's only going to happen in simulation. So this is offline. So this means that we can do it anytime. And then still at test time, we can just use it with the real sensor. And what I want to stress now is that we have converted the problem of tactile localization into a problem of matching. Now, all we need to be able to say is, which is the contact in simulation that is more similar to the one that comes from the real system. So basically do this matching so that we can actually identify which poses in simulation are more likely to produce estimated contact. So how do we solve this matching problem? Well, at train time in simulation, what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute a dense set of simulated contacts. And you can imagine this as a grid where we just discretize all the contact poses and we just get those elements. And then we're just gonna create a new random contact pose. And we're gonna ask the question, which of the elements in the dense set is more similar to this contact pose that we just generated? And because of we're gonna identify this contact, we're gonna get a label that it's all zeros except for a one in the closest element. And now we're just gonna embed those images using an encoder, and this is gonna give us some, some encoding. So that now all we have to do is compare those. And by just comparing, just computing distances between encodings and then using the softmax, we now get a predictable likelihood. And now basically what you need to do is compare this predictable likelihood with your label to actually back propagate all this information and learn an encoding that is basically capable to say, given two images of contacts, are they close or not based on the distance of the poses that generated them. So now let's move into test time. Now we are, now we are in the, with the robot. Well, all the information that I'm showing now, we already have. We already have computed encodings for this dense set. All it's left to do is get the contact from the real sensor, encode it, make this comparison, and get the likelihood. And now this is the likelihood that is giving us which of the contacts is more likely to be closest to the one that comes from real. And for instance, what we can do is identify the one with highest likelihood and say, this is our best match. This is the contact in simulation that we think is more likely to have created the one that comes from real. As a result, and this is the important part, we're getting post distributions, which again is very important because tactile is gonna be local and we won't always be able to just get the answer. There's gonna be contacts where several poses are actually good uh, to explain a given contact. Now I wanna show some results that we have gotten with Tony. She's a lab mate in our lab. And basically, let's start with one object. This is one of the touches that we tried. Just for reference, this is 10 millimeters on that object. And we are getting with our method an error of 2.5 millimeters. Just for you to have a sense of what it means 2.5 millimeters on this object, basically means that our error fits in between these two. And for most manipulation uh, tasks, this is usually a good error. Why? The, why we are getting such a good errors with this object? This is because most of the contacts on this object, like the one that I just marked, are actually unique contacts. That means that if you were to make a contact error, there is only one post that can explain it. And this is true for many other objects. And as you can see, our method is capable to achieve uh, good performance in all of them. But then there are other objects that actually have many non-unique contacts. And if you look at those, this would be an example where the orange region, any contact on this orange region uh, will look the same, but it comes from different poses. So we wouldn't be able just from a single contact to be able to say which is the post that actually generate this contact. And because of that, what happens is that you get high errors just by looking at the best match. And this is true for different objects that again have many non-unique contacts. The good thing about our algorithm is that it's not just giving us a best estimate, it's giving us distributions. And why is this important? I will explain in a moment, but let me just show you another case of non-uniqueness. For this object, for instance, uh, we just got this, uh, these tactile images where we're marking white where the contact has happened. And this is again our best match. And as you can see, the best match looks the same. But then if you look at the actual poses, you can see the mismatch. Again, this is a non-unique contact. And because of that, what you can also see is that the pose errors, one is small, the other one is high. But again, because we're dealing with pose distributions, we expect that the pose distribution will be able to say both poses are very likely. 
So let's look at those, at the post distributions that we are generating. So let's look at this contact. Orange is marking the contact. And these are the tactile images that we are getting. And in fact, there are several poses on this object that could generate the same contacts. Because of that, our method is giving a very wide distribution over the possible of, over the possible poses that could explain this contact. This is all the green region. All the green dots are actually contacts that would make sense. There are other contacts on this object that instead have a very narrow distribution. As you can see in this case, there is only one region that seems likely. And this is something that it's important because if you were to make a contact on this object, you would rather have this content than this one because then perception will have an easy time to say what is the pose of the object. So this is something important to keep in mind because we're gonna use this later on. And I just wanna say something, which is that if someone has any questions anytime, any clarification, feel just feel, just feel free to jump in and just make those questions. No need to wait until the end. And now I just wanna show one a different example. Where again, you can see that these two contacts actually would be able to generate this image. And because of that, our method is capable to actually give us two different, two different regions. This is a pin by model distribution of a possible object poses. So now, because we have these distributions, what would happen if we have extra information? If we have another distribution, let's say a prior. Well, if we consider that we have a 10 millimeter prior, what happens now is that Actually, we can get much better results by using these pose distributions combined with this prior that only allows us to look into poses that are no more than 10 millimeters far away from the true answer. And these are actually good results. If you just were to randomly sample a pose that is 10 millimeters away, you will get much higher ones. I hope you can see, but basically using pose distributions, we can actually add information coming from other contacts, from vision, other sensing modalities, even kinematics. And this is something that we can use to our advantage. This is a file that we have used. And again, this is based on matching. And what I wanna show you now is that this approach that we have used for tactile actually also translates into vision. Vision is gonna be, you are getting a depth image. And what we wanna do is identify the object pose. So the object is the thing that I just marked in yellow here. And this is something that other people have looked into. and have found similar solutions, but the key to our approach is that we are gonna get meaningful pose distributions. And as a result, we're gonna be able to combine them with tactile and with other um, perception systems that give us an estimate on the object pose. So how does it work for vision? The first thing is that we can take a crop. And now what we wanna answer is what is the pose of the object given this crop? In simulation, we can do the same. We can just simulate contact poses. And from those, we can just get simulated, uh, we can just render depth images. And now again, what we have done is just reduce our problem to a matching one. So basically what we need to do is find what depth images in simulation are more likely to match the one that comes from the real. And this again is giving us a post distribution. So I'm just gonna take some time to summarize what I have shown you, how we, we have solved, the, how we have done to achieve some general and accurate perception. And for that, well, we, the first thing is that we are only using simulated data. And as a result, once you give me a new object, as long as I have the shape, we can already go and localize it with the robot sensor. The second thing is that we are reasoning over post distributions. And this in the end allows us to also integrate vision and tactile. And we have shown that vision and tactile can be done with the same algorithm without making any modifications to it. Okay, next I'm gonna move into how you put um, these perception systems into a more complex solution for robotic manipulation. And this is gonna be pick and placing. Pick and placing is an important problem because basically it's asking us to go from an structure setting to a structure one. So let me show you how we are gonna think about pick and place. The first thing is that we are gonna have this structure setting where there is some objects in front of the robot and we will need to pick them, at least one. Let's say we pick one of them. The next thing is that we are gonna need to localize. And that means just saying, what is the pose of the object with respect to the robot's hands? And again, for that, we're gonna just use the methods that we already described. And finally, once we know this position, we would just like to go and place it in a given configuration. That placement is gonna be very precise. And what happens sometimes is that depending on how the object is in your hand, you won't be able to just go and immediately place it. You will need to change this configuration. And for that, we are gonna use what we call a regrasp. This system of pick and place is very important. For instance, in industry, I've been working with mine and ABB to see how we can move our technologies into deployment. 
why is this so important for them to solve pick and placing for novel objects? Well, this is because you imagine that now you have a situation where you're going from a structure to structure. So if you are to have another pipeline coming after, now you will have an easier time because now you know exactly where all the objects are. So you, you could just, just put this into a machine and I have the machine do all the rest of the parts because now you are in a structure setting after doing the pick and place operation. Okay, so let's just look how it looks like. This is our robot solving the pick and place operation for a robot that it has never gathered any real experience. All the work that we are doing is just coming from simulation data. Now you will see how it's identified that it needs to regress. So just gonna go and just regress this object so that finally it can just go and place it. Okay, so in this system, we are gonna say that generality comes from the fact that we only need the object shape. And after that, we only use simulation. So no need for real experience. And we're gonna get precision because we're gonna use accurate perception, probabilistic reason that is gonna allow us to combine vision and tactile. And finally, also task aware planning. So let me just briefly mention what is task aware planning in this context. Task aware planning, for instance, means that you need to be able to do good grass. You need to plan for grass that are actually gonna be stable, are gonna fall, the object is not gonna fall, it's just gonna remain into the robot's fingers. We also wanna be able to do grasp that are actually gonna be easy for perception. So let's look at this case. So now the, uh, the robot is grasping the object and is going into a location where the contacts are non-unique. We already know what a contact is non-unique, right? It means that there is several poses that could explain it. And what happens here is that there actually there is a perception failure. This is the predictive pose, but the true one is actually a different one. Again, this is because this grasp didn't take into account that this contest would be uh, non-unique. So in, in practice, we would like to go for, for grasp on the object that would go into unique grasp, unique contact, sorry, so that we can very easily then use perception to identify the object pose. And finally, we would also like to go for grasp on the object that would simplify the operations needed for, place, for them placing the object. So for instance, in this uh, configuration that I'm showing, it would take two regress to just go and place the object. So to place the object, you first need to do this regress, a second one, and then you can just go ahead. Instead, if you aim at the, this grasp here that I'm showing, you only need one regress to just go and place the object. So you would prefer a grasp on the object initially that would simplify the number of regress that you need. So in practice, in the real system, the pipeline that we are following for pick and placing is, the, is this one. We have these sensor inputs, and those are depth images and tactile images that come as contacts. Now for the depth image, we are gonna do two things. The first one is to grasp sampling. We're just gonna identify places where it would make sense for us to go and grasp an object. And then we're also gonna use vision to the pose estimation with the algorithm that I proposed in the previous part of the talk. Once we know how to do that, we can just compute the grass selection. That just means, can we identify the grass that has more likelihood to be good for grasping? So we want the grass to succeed, but we also want to ease the work from perception and finally reduce the number of regress that we are needed. So when we do a selection, we're gonna to need to take those into account. Let's say that we selected this grass, then basically now we are making contact if we go for that pick on the object and we're getting these tactile images that allow us to just update the post estimation from vision. And finally, we are gonna use model-based planning to figure out how to go from this initial pose of the object to one that allows us to place the object into the desired location. So let me just show the video with all the steps in it. So first we start with this grass sampling. After that, we'll select the best grass and also get an estimate of the vision. Now we go for this grass and we are gonna make contact with the object. So we are gonna start getting title images that are meaningful. And in this case, those are unique, uh, unique contacts. So basically when we can identify the pose of the object. And finally, we can plan and execute what is the best solution for us to just go and put the object into the side location. The key thing here is that all these components, we are only gonna learn them in simulation. And we still expect that our solutions can transfer to the real world. So now I wanna show you some examples of how actually for different objects that the robot has never interacted with, is it still capable to solve this precise pick and placing. Okay. 
The object that I'm showing now has a lot of non-unique contacts. So again, the robot needs to be able to reason over what is good contacts on that object so that then I can just go and play the placement. This other object is one that allows us to just go and place the object without any regress. And finally, this is an object that has a um, kind of an L shape. But again, you can see how the robot is capable to reason about how to reconfigure it in its hands to then just go and place it. Another thing that our solution allows us is to reason over different configurations. So here you can see how the robot just has a few objects um, on the initial platform and is capable to identify what is the best grasp in its, in its case and then just perform a placement in different locations. Without any changes, we can also allow the robot to think about um, how to place it horizontally. So this is again, because our um, planning for placements is model-based, we have this flexibility of allowing different configurations. One thing that I get asked very often is what happens when now you don't have a perfect model? Let's say you don't have access to the true shape. What would happen then? Well, we've been looking into this direction by actually scanning the object and getting a reconstructed model. So now what's gonna happen is that in simulation, instead of using the true object model, we're only gonna use a reconstructed. So all the steps that we need in simulation are gonna be done using this noisy model of the object. But then on the real system, we are still gonna use the true object. And what we have found is that actually our solution is capable to still deal with this level of noise. And the reason because of that, I think is, because our perception system, for instance, is just solving a matching problem. So even if your contacts or your models are now more noisy, still when you're solving the best match, the object, the contact that is more similar to the one that's coming from real is still the true one. So this is a summary of, our, of the work that I had just presented to you. We are just doing pick and placing, taking into account is the grass gonna work? Is it gonna be useful for perception? And finally, is it gonna ease the number of regress that I need to take in order to place a location? And for that, we'll be using general perception models, probabilistic reasoning. Basically, we've been combining vision and tactile to estimate the perception. And also uh, we're taking an expectation to select the best grass. What is the grass that in expectation is gonna give us uh, the best uh, results? And finally, there is task about planning. Again, reasoning about each of the components of the system to identify what is the best pick on the object that is gonna be useful for all the components. So this is a summary of the words that I wanted to present today, but now I wanna go into what I think is next. And again, the goal is, can we achieve robots that can solve many tasks uh, with a skill without compromising on performance? And together, I just wanna propose three directions that I think are interesting to look into. So this is because right now, some of the words that have been shown are in a structure setting, but we know that robots in the real world are actually gonna to have to face higher levels of uncertainty. So this uncertainty can come from different sources. One of them is just sensor, actuation, sensor and actuation noise. This means the internal noise from the robot. But there is other sources like environments. Environments can be unstructured, cluttered. So how we get robots to deal with those? And finally, dynamics sometimes are gonna be unknown. There's gonna be a model dynamics and we will need to have a robot that is capable to deal with those. To move towards the direction, one of the things that I think is important to again, get more general and precise robots is to actively learn about what matters. So usually when we get a robot and goes into a new situation, the first classical approach would be, okay, let's first just build a general model of the environment. Something that independently of the task that the robot has to solve, it just capable of identify maybe all the objects, their locations, if there is any clear collisions between those objects. And once this is done, then we're gonna think about what is the task that another robot has to solve. But let's say we are looking into a situation where the only goal is just to grab this mug. Probably we don't need to care too much about identifying that the thing next to it is a laptop or that there is an object. Probably there is just a few things that if we focus on those are gonna be sufficient for us to finish this task successfully. So when we're facing the set settings, ideally what we would like to do is prioritize about the things that matter. So for instance, in the, and again, 
what matters is going to be test dependent. So for instance, in this case, maybe we just be, where is the handle of the mug? Is the mug empty or not? And what are possible collisions between the mug and the environment? So now I want to show this in the context of shape. So how we care about the parts of this, an object that matter when we're just facing an object that we have never seen before. And here, very briefly, I want to mention some work that we have already been doing, which is called tactile slam. And this work, what it's doing is it's recovering shape and pose. It's recovering shape by using a Gaussian process, and then it solves this slam problem by using ISA, by integrating all this information. And here you can see some results, both in simulation and on the real system. And basically, by just contacting the object and following its, con its by just following the object, and integrating all the sensor information that in this case is just roll resolution, it's just whether contact is made or not, and in some cases, whether there is force, uh, we can actually recover an estimate of the object pose as well as the object shape. But there is a problem here, which is that data just comes from passive exploration. So if there was to be an, a region where there is more noise or a region that is more useful and we need more precision because of our test, we are not really dealing with that. We don't have a strategy that would allow us to just seek this extra information that we might need. And there is another thing about shape, which is that if we now instead look at commercial scanners, we've been surprised by how accurate they can give us reconstructions. So here I'm comparing some objects uh, and the reconstructed model that we got in our lab. And basically you can see that the reconstruction is really good. So could we also use this in with our robots? Well, right now commercial scanners have a problem. That is basically that if you want to get these nice scans, usually you have to put the object in a control environment where the, where the scan is only looking at that object and the object is kind of covered often. But I think we can do better. I think there is an opportunity for us to mix uh, the ideas from both. And to that, I think thinking about the task, maybe having a function that guides us on how to solve this problem is going to be really useful. So let me just give an example. Let's say we have this object and we just get this reconstruction. We just took a, a few images from the object, we just got this reconstruction. Well, this might be fine if you just wanna pick and place the object, but if instead you wanna hang it, you don't have information about the hole. And that would be a problem, right? So then you might need to select extractions that will allow you to identify where is the hole on this object. So let's say that now you get this model. This model to some extent is very high resolution and would definitely allow us to just go and hand the object. But what if now I ask you, can you screw it? Well, then you don't have information of where are the threads and that would be a problem. So maybe even vision is not gonna be able to give you the right resolution. So to move forward into this idea of how we get a more precise shape, we might need to also integrate uh, different contact and visual information. So basically integrate different sensor information like contact we know that in this situation would be able to give us all the threads on the object. And finally, if we are able to recover online all these shapes and keep improving them to the right resolution, there's still gonna be a question of how do we get our internal models for the robot to adapt to these new shapes that we are getting over time as we get more resolution for them. So I think this is also something that we need to figure out how to do. Now, also thinking about how the robot interacts with the world, there is a question of making sense of observations. And for that, I just wanna mention the task of assembly because I think it's one that is very interesting. Like now you're just gonna take some objects and you're gonna to try to put them together. And if you wanna do that in a way that is general and accurate, you wanna probably reason about vision. Where are those objects in the world? Where are they located? How they look like? But also, because we have already been thinking about it, contact, can give us a lot of information about where are these objects. So maybe let's say with vision, we localize them, we make a contact, now we can improve their location. But now we are thinking about assembly. So this is not sufficient, right? Because once the objects just touch each other, there's gonna be forces that are gonna play a role. And what I would like to argue is that at this point, we don't yet have a good intuition of what it means good, bad forces. We don't have, have a language for forces. Like for vision, we know when I aim for visibility, avoid occlusions. For contact, we know that there is unique contacts, non-unique contacts, and the ones that have more features, the ones that are more unique, are the ones that we would prefer. But it's not clear how that would translate to forces. What it means a good about force, what it means that a force is a stock that is not when you're doing the assembly. So I think we need to start thinking about how we can represent those forces. Well, I wanna show you our sensor. 
Again, our sensor is high resolution because it has a membrane that has a camera behind that is just recording how the membrane deforms. If you put some dots on this membrane, you can actually track how those dots move. And this is very important because it's basically showing us that the force is not just an image like contact or vision, is actually a vector field and a temporal sequence. So if you look at this image at the bottom, you will see how this tangential force is evolving as we apply external forces on this object. And now you can see the displacement of these dots is actually giving those arrows that basically represent how force is evolving over time. And again, these are very complex uh, vector fields. And ideally, we would like to find a way to represent them, to be able to say, maybe this is a stuck, this is moving, this is moving up, down. So how we find maybe this is a sliding, a sleeping. Um, so how do we get a representation for those forces? And this is just one example that I think shows the complexity of it. So this is a, these are all cases where there is a balance of forces. There is only um, the forces from gravity and the ones from the gripper. And if you look at it, all the fields basically integrate to zero. So all these fields, there is no resultant force coming out of them. So how we would put them into a same embedding? If we all just want to detect this, there is balance, we would like to create the same embedding, but that might be something that for this case is obvious because they all integrate to zero, but there will be also other situations like the object is stuck that it won't be so obvious. So I think starting to work on forces is something that is very important because forces will come anytime that we're interacting with objects. And finally, there is also some work that I want to be doing on continuously updating the knowledge of robots. And again, the idea here is that we already have a lot of knowledge that comes from gravity, that comes from Newton's laws, material properties, and simulations are giving us a really nice way to add this information. Simulations are not perfect, but they definitely capture intuitive physics. They can capture that something is gonna fall if left in the air. They're also gonna understand that you can push but you're not, you cannot pull if you're just making contact. And they are also a very nice platform to get useful data and very easily. So how can we use simulation? Well, I would like to say that most of the cases that we see where simulation is being used, it follows this approach where you have simulation and then you just use it to turn maybe a policy, learn something, and then just transfer it into the real world. Then it works or it does not. And in fact, sometimes if it doesn't work, what happens is that there is a researcher that just goes in and says, okay, how can I change my simulation? So the next time when I transfer it into the real world, it's gonna work. So basically the researcher is closing the loop. But ideally, we would like to find ways that are more systematic, where we can grow from simulation to real world, but then also close the loop and let the, all the information from the real world to actually guide how simulation should evolve. So if there is noise in our observations, maybe we could extend our simulation to be stochastic so that it can also reason how possible noises um, on the sensor information. Or if one action just failed because the model of simulation was wrong, can we update this simulation? We've been doing some work in this direction, by basically creating what we call residual models. This is basically, you have your simulation, you have your model, and by collecting some data, you can just learn a residual on top of it. So that now by combining the two, you get more accurate performance. But I think this is not sufficient because these are just very simple um, cases where you can just express everything with a single neural network. And because of that, you can just learn it very easily. But if you have a more complex system like this one, well, when this is gonna fail, it's gonna be unclear how will you assign blame? How would you say, why did the object fall? Instead of going into the place in location, was it because of perception? Was it because of the initial grasp? Was it because of the planning? So in those cases, assigning blame and assigning merit is something that we need to look into so that then we can go back into the simulation and ideally close the loop more efficiently by reusing this real data. It is very expensive, but because we're getting it, there is no reason why we should just throw it away. So I think these components I've been talking about now are really important. So let me just show you with an example. We have already seen this video and the people that is very capable to very precisely take those objects and put them into the right location. And I would also like to say that they're actually using all these strategies that I mentioned. They are actively learning about the matters. They don't need to first understand what are all the pieces so that they can just go and select one of them. They also know how to make sense of observations. They are actually putting those pieces into the boards and they know when the piece is in there, they actually can make sense of the force that they are sensing to say, okay, now this is sufficient, I don't have to keep pressing. And finally, they can reuse knowledge from previous executions. Probably they ha there has been many days where they have been doing this task. 
So they are not learning it from scratch. They already have some knowledge that they can just basically update is needed, but otherwise just go and reuse. So again, I think by following these ideas, we can both aim at generality and precision, which to me is very important if we're gonna get robots that can solve multiple tasks uh, without compromising on precision. So now I just wanna take the time to just thank all my collaborators. It's been really great to work with them. Otherwise, none of these works would have been possible. And now I would like to thank you and ask if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for the nice talk. Um, let's open the stage for questions. If you have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask it directly. Or if you don't want to, to talk, you can, you can write in the chat. Hello. I have a two part question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So when you were talking about the, the median pose error, yes, I observed that uh, when uh, the, the median pose error is generally high for with the values that you have given, the median mm -hmm. pose error is higher for objects with uh, let's say lower geometric complexity or a higher number of axes of symmetry. <laughs> let's say uh, like a bolt or a cylindrical object but in real life scenarios mm -hmm. uh, while uh, picking up a bottle of water or a pen it's always easier to do that than any complex object right mm -hmm. so uh, why do you think this uh, error is increasing with the increasing number of axes of symmetry okay um, so let me just mention one thing that, which is that we actually account for symmetry. So even if it is symmetrical, we don't need, like when we're creating the dense set of contacts, we don't need to include contacts that would just come from kind of poses that are symmetric. So if there is a symmetry, we can actually encode that into the dense set. So the problem in those objects is not symmetry by itself, it's what you could call pseudo symmetries. There is different uh, regions of the object that look the same, but those poses would not actually be symmetrical. So it's pseudo, pseudo symmetries. Like a bottle is symmetric. And I think for a bottle, uh, we would have an easier time if you were to go at the top because it has features, but then all the parts in the middle, they all look the same because contact is very local. So this, um, let me maybe see if I can find the bottle. I don't have any bottle right now with me, but let's just take my phone. So all these contacts in here, we look the same for local because uh, contact is very local. So for title, this all will look the same. So this is kind of a pseudo symmetry. All these regions here is kind of look the same, but a pose in there is the same as a pose in the middle. And this is why you're seeing that for these objects that kind of look elongated sometimes, you will see this problem. But there is one thing that is useful there, which is that you can aim at contacts that are unique. Like the thing that I show in the second, in the last part of the world, which is that if you can identify regions that are um, that have more features that are more unique, like would be the cap of the bottle, then you can just aim at those and that would actually solve your problem. So in the object that we were showing high errors, this is because we were just considering all the contacts equally. If we have just gone and say, okay, let me just find out the contacts that are very meaningful, that are very, uh, have a lot of features, then you could Im immediately see how the errors just become really, really low. Thank you. Is there any other question? I think Carlo has a question. He just raised his hand. Oh yeah, Carlo, go ahead, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, one more detailed, the one more general. Maybe I start with the detailed one. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested, how, how do you train the neural network that estimates the contact image? Uh, like from the tactile image to the contact image, how do you get the ground truth for the contact image? Uh, that's a fantastic question. I actually may have a slide that shows that. Let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, this one. I mean, it's very simple, but maybe if I can show you the slide, it's easier. This is for a, a previous version of the sensor. But the idea here is that we basically just touch it, we just put the sensor, in a platform once, and we just make it touch a few contacts. Like you, you could just see this video, how we just made this contact. And basically now, because you know the sensor position and you know the position also of this panel, you can actually just go and get a tactile image, but also you can use the model 
of this contact of this panel to actually also generate a contact shape. And this is how you get labeled data. So basically, once we get a new sensor, we just put it into this platform, we make it touch this board in several locations, and this gives us this training data that then we can just go and use for the neural network. Oh, sorry, I just couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, this procedure is done in the real world. I mean, like, it's it's a real world platform. Yes. OK, got it. Thank you. The, the idea is that you only do it once. Actually, the last time that we did it for our sensor was more than a year ago. Um, and even if the sensor changes slightly, we have seen that it's very robust. Um, right. So yeah, that's something very, and even sometimes we also use the same neural network for different sensors and it's just still working really well. So we've become a bit lazy and we haven't done it even for new sensors. We just keep using the same model because it's working really well. And in terms of number of data, a few thousand, like 1,000, 2,000 of these label data usually is enough. Um, and we train it with peaks to peaks in case that is something that you weigh. Yeah. Thank you. And so then my more general question, um, well, you showed a very nice video in the start uh, where we've seen that humans can kind of do things without even looking, right? So <laughs> reasoning on, on what they touch. And uh, although your method is then is assuming that you have a model of the object that can be yes. extracted, uh, can be given as a ground truth, but you have a full model of the object. Now, my question is, um, in order to kind of more like resemble the versatility of humans, uh, like so without even looking, without even knowing the object, we can grasp and regrasp an object um, where do you see this going? Is it too difficult to do with robots or, um, you know, like there are different uh, class of techniques that could be used in this case? So when you say this case, you mean when you don't know the object shape? At all, yes. Like if you just make contact and you want to use this local information to do something with it, let's say you want to change hand yeah. uh, with which you're grasping the object. Um, so actually, we have some work where we just exp uh, explore this idea of can you assess the grasp stability if needed uh, from an object just from contact? And if not, can you actually maybe just do a, a local policy that will allow us to now get into a good contact? And it turns out that yes, for objects that even you might have less data about, tactile already gives you a sense. For, because for, for instance, from tactile images, you can get a sleeping. So if you are detecting contact and there is no sleeping, the object should remain in your hands, right? Because then it's a sticking contact, and if it's a sticking contact, the grass should, 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 should succeed. So you can do that. So if your task only requires you to maybe grasp an object and identify a regress, I mean, tactile is local, so you probably will need to use vision to identify where is another place where you can just go and use contact. But I think that would be possible. Like if you don't need to really understand the shape of the object for your task, because maybe pick and place, but where you place is not so important. Or let's say maybe all you want to do is just put the object in the floor stably so that it doesn't fall. I think for those strategies, having a perfect model of the object is not necessary, but you will need to reason probably, let's say you just want to put it stably so that it doesn't fall. Then maybe just being able to reason about forces. When I'm in a stable, balanced position, that will be more important than actually having the object pose. So I think these tactile sensors allow you to do that. We have already done some work on assessing grasp stability without knowing the object model. Um, so yeah, I think you could definitely look into those. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, we have uh, a question in the chat. So there is Madi who's asking, I'd like to hear your comments about generalization of your methods for precise robotic assembly dealing with uncertainty due to flexibility or compliance of objects. Yes, so that is a very nice question. I think we are now going into the question of the formable objects. And I would say that if the deformability is low, and what I mean by low is that as you make contact, the shape of the of where you're making contact doesn't change all that much, then you probably could still reuse some of our work. Like let's say something that is made of, of rubber that definitely would deform a bit, but not a lot. You probably could use it. I think our method with, would also uh, handle where well cases where there is actually some features they can, you can just go and explore, like let's say maybe a button in a shirt, right? The shirt would definitely the, the form, but then identifying this button on the shirt is something that we could do. But I would also say that as things get more deformable, even the notion of pose becomes very blurry, right? Like what is a pose in a deformable object? Well, 
it depends, right? Because if the object just keeps changing its shape, its center even might not be its center anymore. So I think in those cases, we need to rethink what we want out of those. Uh, because sometimes even the task for the formable objects is going to require you less precision than when you have a rigid object. So I would say in some cases, our approach can extend to that and just aim for localizing features if you're capable to make a good contact on those. But if you just think about the highest level of the formability, like something that just even won't preserve any type, any sort of shape, then I think you, we will need to rethink. I don't think this approach as it is right now will be able to handle this situation. Great. I don't know if that convinced Madi, but I think so. There's nothing more in the chat. Yeah, yeah, that's yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I have a question. Maybe it's, it was a bit related to, to the question Carlo had, but it's uh, more about uh, the case in which you know the object. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, for instance, my, my use case is the robotic bartender or something similar. So you have a, a glass of water, you know. You know the objects. Maybe you also know the strength, how strong you can hold it. But you have the, um, you can feel the glass maybe, and the glass. So so the the sheer forces or the slip uh, yeah. can change over time. I wanted a bit to understand what is the rate at which you are operating this uh, uh, the system, and if if it would at all be possible to do feedback control to actually adjust the grasp to, for instance, uh, compensate for for the feeling of the glass. Yeah, that's a really nice question. Uh, I didn't mention on the time that it takes, but because most of the computation, most of the bulk is done offline at train at test time, sorry, like when you have the real sensor, all you need to do is a forward pass of a neural network, so very fast. And then a matrix computation, even faster, right? So basically the, the algorithm can work really fast. I think in our computer with one GPU, we've got it to work at 50 Hertz. So I think at 50 hertz, there is definitely some control that you could that you could actually apply and be able to just keep tracking how the object position moves and evolves over time. So we've been able to get uh, 50 hertz. The sensor itself is outputting at 90 hertz, so that would probably be a bottleneck unless you get a camera that through rust can can output images faster. But this is currently our situation uh, where definitely we think there is some control that we can do, um, although. There is some cases where you need even higher frequency, but I think for 50 hertz, uh, given that your resolution is pretty good, and what I mean by that is that unless something is going to fall, probably the object motion is not going to change all that much in 50 hertz. So maybe you would still be in kind of the error of your own model there. So uh, I think, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I have maybe a last question that was related to this one, but you kind of already answered. My question was how. how... How, does, how much does your method rely on the specific choice of camera? Uh, for instance, you know, there are these event-based cameras, so the other cameras that are, that are way more uh, uh, fast in, in providing you measurements. C can it scale to such cameras? So I think for our approach, the biggest bottleneck, not bottleneck, but the biggest uh, property that we are demanding from a sensor is that you can actually simulate, you can actually do some sort of rendering of how you expect the contact or how you expect vision to look like in this in each situation. So if you have a way, I mean, even cameras will be temporal. So then probably, I mean, it's extending to maybe a temporal sequence or a few frames, I don't think that would be a big problem. As long as you can simulate, okay, if you move from this to that, then this is how I expect the even camera to look like. I think if you could do that, um, I think there is room for you to, to use those sensors. For instance, there are other sensors for tactile that are actually giving us high resolution information and even lower resolution. But because we can simulate those, then we would still be able to use our approach. Like I was showing before a green sensor. This is because the same approach has been used for different sensors. And again, it's, this is because we can uh, simulate some properties. And because of that, we can just use, use this matching. The more information, the easier is the matching but you can still use our method. It's very cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are, we are uh, right in time. Uh, I want to thank you again, Maria. Uh, maybe, I don't know, do you have a, your email somewhere on the slides so that if people want to reach out, they can ask deeper questions? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't think so. Um, or, 
I can share it, uh, or you can share it on the chat in case people want to. So basically, it's my last name. Um, yes, my last name, so B-A-U-Z-A at MIT.edu. If anyone has any questions, I can put it in the chat, too. So. Okay, I just did it. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Maria, and good luck for the next steps, uh, for the next adventures. It was great having the talk from you. Good luck for everything. Thank you very much, everybody. And see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Bye. Thank you.